Welcome to Legal Nurse Podcast. I'm Pat Iyer, and I have a guest with me today who I met when we both became active in a program to help us make better video. Rena Romano is a speaker, a author, a consultant. She has prepared and delivered a TEDx talk on her topic. She's part of the RAIN Speakers Bureau and a featured guest on the Oprah Winfrey Show, back when Oprah was doing a show. Wow. Mm -hmm. I've heard of many people who wanted to be on her show, but you're the first person I've spoken to who's actually been on it. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And it's great to be here with your with your audience, too. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. You are most welcome. Tell us about your topic. Tell our listener how you got involved in speaking professionally about your topic. Sure. Um, I, most of your listeners might know, um, or they may not know, of Toastmasters. And in 2007, I joined a club called Toastmasters, where you find your voice and you practice public speaking, because I knew that I wanted to become a public speaker and share my story of triumph over child abuse and sexual assault. So I joined them and um, it just kind of snowballed. I knew that I wanted to be on stage and uh, practice my, my craft, practice my art of speaking. And um, so it's just snowballed. That's where it all started was with Toastmasters. Many people who are listening to us have heard of children who've been sexually assaulted in child abuse. They, uh, as legal nurse consultants, may have worked on cases to help attorneys with those situations. What struck me, Rena, is that often this is a hidden, not talked about subject. And it may come out years later. It may never come out for some people. Or in our profession, it comes out because there's some visible sign or a child says something and then the legal system, the criminal system gets involved. Yep. So tell us, what does it take to be able to talk about it? A, a subject that is so often never addressed. You know, it's different for everyone, and I can only speak to my experience and, and one, you know, a few of my sister survivors that I was in group therapy with, but you come to a point where you become sick and tired of the secret. You know, and Brene Brown, the, the godmother of, of shame, she says, shame is lethal. Shame is deadly. And uh, I was suicidal. But before hearing Brene Brown's words, I, I was watching the Oprah Winfrey show for years and her show and her story helped save my life because I realized, Pat, that talking about the experience, holding it inside and denying it and pretending it didn't happen, oh, could have gotten an Oscar for pretending um, that it didn't happen was really killing me. And the more we suppress it, the more it's going to come out in other fashions, you know, addiction, um, suicidal, lots of ways. And I just got tired and watching Oprah and she had interviewed people on her show that have been abused and then her sharing her story of child sexual abuse. I knew that holding it in any, I couldn't, I had it to speak. I had to speak. I had to get help. And I was suicidal one night and I realized I drank myself into a stupor until I finally passed out and I didn't want to die. I just didn't know how to live with the shame and the pain. Um, but the shame is so deadly. We either keep our secret suppressed or the memories. I kept the pain and the, uh, suppressed, but it was killing me. And watching Oprah and other men and women who are survivors who have now been successful um, 
encouraged me that that's, I wanted to live a happy, healthy, productive life. So at the age of 34, I got help. I called for help. And I've been on a, on a mission to get help, get happy, and get healthy with my life. So was that like 20, 25 years, 30 years? 64 years young now, so it's been 30 years. <laughs> and from the time of the abuse, you kept that secret inside for how many years? Well, the, uh, the abuse started at the age of four by a family member, mm. by a family member, and it went on for almost two decades. So in my early 20s, and then in my early 20s, I was sexually assaulted by a colleague at work. And sadly, I couldn't report it. He broke into my home at night and I had to go to work the next day. I was on my own, had to pay my bills. I could not report him to my uh, supervisor, my boss, because unfortunately my boss was sexually harassing me. And 30 years ago, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, excuse me, I have allergies. But, um, you know, who, I had a friend that had been raped and the police, unfortunately, back then, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and still today, sadly, um, she was blamed for the rape. Well, what were you wearing? Why were you drinking? Um, I was home asleep in my bed. Also, it was a family member who molested me for years. Um, so... It went on at, at the age of 34, I finally, you know, watching Oprah Winfrey and watching those shows and seeing how people were talking about their abuse, it made me realize I grew tired of being ashamed of crimes that I did not commit. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to live a happy, healthy, productive life. And I knew by watching those shows, the only way to do that was to get help. How did watching those shows lead to you becoming a guest on the show? <laughs> well, watching her show, and of course, they were always looking for, for stories. And she was sharing stories of others, uh, survivors of abuse. And Mackenzie Phillips, if uh, she was on her show, and Mackenzie talked about her father... Uh, committing incest with her, even as an older adult. And, and I'm, I was screaming and yelling, you know, it's not your fault, Mackenzie. Um, I don't care how old the child is. That was her father. He should never have molested her. I don't care at what age, whether you're four or 20 or 30, a father does not do that. And I just, you know, knowing that my brother um, he was 11 years my senior. I was four. He was 15 when it started. He's the adult. They are the adult. They should be held responsible for these actions, not us. Mm -hmm. And so she was asking for stories and I sent my story in. I emailed it. And so I have to tell you, Pat, I mean, for two years prior before being on the Oprah Winfrey show, I knew that I was going to be on her show. And I knew it. You know how you feel something in your heart and you just know what's going to happen. And I would tell my friends, they're like, oh yeah, sure, Rena, you're going to be on Oprah Winfrey. And I, but I just knew it deep in my soul. But of course they weren't going to call me up and say, Hey, you want to be on our show? <laughs> I had to send an email and uh, then the rest is history. They called and hmm. I went. And what was that experience like? Oh my God, it was scary. Scariest thing I've ever done, but <laughs> yeah, sitting next to Oprah, mm -hmm. um, there's a picture of me on stage in my TEDx talk um, on stage with her. I, I did have to receive permission to use the photo in the TEDx talk, and I'm, I, I'm able to use the photo in my, uh, uh, on, when I'm on stage, but not allowed to use it in my marketing you know, they're very, they're very strict about those things. But the experience was, I, I don't know. I just knew that 
I wanted to share my story, Pat. I wanted to, I wanted to show other survivors that we don't have to be ashamed of the crimes committed against us. And that's what keeps us silent for so many years because of the shame. And, and people will say, you know, oh, well, don't let your past define you. And I'm like, no, 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 it does define me because with my Thrive Perspective program, I say that there's always an upside. I don't let the crime define me. I let my courage, strength, and tenacity to persevere during those crimes and after. That's what defines me. And that's the message that I wanna share with other survivors. Now we have nothing to be ashamed of and everything to be proud of being able to survive what we survived. And I think that's just so important. I, I want to share that message. And the chances are very high, Rena, that somebody listening to this has gone through this personally or knows somebody who's going through it. Yep. Your message is essential. What I find so compelling is that you have the speaking skills and the passion and the personal history to be able to make a difference for people through your advocacy work because of what we just talked about so far. This is a secret, don't tell, you'll get in trouble, mom and dad will be mad at you, you know, whatever threats are used by the perpetrator. Yep. Tell our listener about what you now have in place as an advocacy program as a result of your interest in this area and your desire to help other people. Well, I did my TEDx talk in, two years ago. It has over 153,000 views now. I'm so, so thrilled with that. I'm hearing the, the TEDx talk, they can find it on YouTube. And it's called, the title is Healing from Sexual Abuse Can Start With One Word. And I don't tell people the word. They have to go watch the talk to find mm -hmm. out. But with that TEDx talk, I'm receiving thank yous from men and women survivors from all over the world, Pat. And it's, it's humbling and I'm honored. And, and they're saying thank you for the hope that I'm giving them because my message is not to be ashamed of the crimes committed against us, but rather be proud of your courage, strength, and tenacity. And so seeing those thank yous and receiving those messages from, from men and women all over the world is encouraging me and, and it's helping me, ha you know, make my voice even stronger because I was scared to do this. I was so afraid to share my story. And I, you know, I wanna tell your nurses, uh, I had a physical and a mental breakdown after the sexual assault in my early 20s, and I ended up in the hospital. I was having a physical mental breakdown. We didn't talk about these things back then, and I don't think nurses or doctors were really trained back then to look for these signs. Now, now thankfully, they are. But I was in the hospital. I was just broken, and a nurse came in, and I'll, I don't remember her name. I will never forget her. And she came in and sat down next to me and, and she said, can I hold your hand? And I was crying and I cry. I'm going to cry now just thinking about her because she was so special. And she said, you know, I'm here if you need to talk. And I just, I was bawling, crying. And I, I couldn't tell her my secret. I, I felt like I would be blamed and shamed, but I will never ever forget that nurse. I will never forget her. I don't know her name. I don't, I don't remember her name, but I'll never forget that moment. She made me feel like I was important. So I want to say thank you to all the nurses because you are our heroes. And I, I thank you for that. And I'm so glad I'm able to share that story with you. <sighs> I remember a time when the, the Joint Commission who regulates most hospitals in the country. It's a voluntary accreditation. But I remember when they asked healthcare providers to include in assessment forms, is there anyone at home who is hurting you? Mm. A broad enough question to be able to bring in victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. And yep. it got put in the all the admission assessment forms. I was in 
nursing staff development in a hospital in Trenton when that regulation came through and it required us to redesign our forms. So we were looking at it from that perspective. It also connected with me on a different level because the first article that I ever wrote was about a battered woman who was beaten by her husband so badly that he paralyzed her. Yeah. And I thought about all the women who go into emergency departments with these bogus stories about how I tripped and fell down the stairs or I hit my neck on the door frame or I tripped, you know, all the things that women say who try to cover up when they're being assaulted. Right. And how that environment has changed. So from, from your perspective, <clears throat> what have you seen different in how people are able to talk about sexual assault or domestic violence now compared to when you were going through it? Or is it the same? Oh, it has improved. It needs to still improve. Uh, I made a hashtag, make telling safe. And I talk about that in my TEDx talk. Still people, um, when we share our story, when we're able to finally share our story, we have to, and we must be careful who we share it to. Um, nurses, doctors, uh, first responders are now being trained on how to respond kindly um, and with empathy and, and with, with, to listen without interruption or judgment. And that is crucial because before I think it was victim blaming and we're still victim blaming, but it's not on the scale that it was when, you know, when 30, 40 years ago, it's getting better, but it can still improve. And if someone has the courage to share their story, please listen without interruption or judgment. And then just say, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for your courage. And if you don't know how to help, just say that. I know that nurses are being trained now. So this is for the listener, maybe a family member that somebody's going to say it. Just say, thank you for sharing. I don't know what to do, but I'm willing to, to see what kind of resources we can find for you. And I was very fortunate in my family when I told them they listened without interruption or judgment and they didn't shame, blame, or pity me. And that really helped in my healing, uh, I, in my healing and my recovery because of that, because I've seen so many victim survivors judged, blamed, pitied, um, you know, blamed for what happened to them. And that really can hinder the healing process. So it's changed a lot. We still have work to do. As you can see it with mm -hmm. the Harvey Weinstein, the, uh, the Kavanaugh hearings, the uh, uh, Bill Cosby. They're still victim blaming. Not everyone. And it is getting better. So, mm -hmm. yep. And I think, you know, Pat, I think the Me Too movement has helped. And I think the internet has helping because on my news feeds, on Twitter, on my Facebook, I've seen men and women say me too. And I'm like, you too? I had no idea. And that's giving us the courage too, to speak out, to, to see other survivors, especially celebrities, you know, famous people. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think that helps. Definitely. It is such a hidden area. Uh, I applaud you for bringing light and bringing attention to this. Yeah. My pleasure. It's, it's, it's um, like I, I'm telling others, I'm not retired. I'm just being repurposed. And I'm finally living my passion and sharing my story on stage. I do a lot of talks at crisis centers and take back the night, um, giving help and hope not only to family members, but to the crisis centers, to survivors. I want, my passion is to show survivors the potential, their potential of what they can achieve after trauma and after counseling. We can live a happy, healthy, productive life. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
And the fact that you're emphasizing this, Rena, means that for so many people who've gone through it, their self-esteem and self-image has been so deformed and battered, whether physically or sexually, that they have to affirmatively recognize their value. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's true. Surround yourself with the people that can rise you, you know, help you rise, help you thrive. It's who you become or the books you read, the, the things you watch and listen to. Um, it's true. And even at 64 years young, I, my self-esteem is growing and growing. My confidence, my self-worth, it's, it's still evolving and getting better and better because a lot of survivors come to me and say, I want to be happy like you. Oh, I'm normal. I'm just like everybody else. I have my up days and my down days. And some days my self-esteem and my con confidence isn't as high as I'd like for it to be. I'm human. But, um, you know, I do things on a positive note every day to help keep me going. But mm -hmm. it's, life's a roller coaster. <clears throat> it's up and down. Yes, it sure is. <laughs> sure yeah. is. I've, I've been debating as we've been talking about sharing my story, which I have never shared with anyone on this podcast. I had a brother who was a sexual predator mm. who was a peeping Tom. He would climb up on top of the garage roof and peer into the bathroom window when my sister and I were taking showers. And we didn't always realize at first he was there. There was a curtain there, but he didn't he could see through it. And I remember coming home from a date one night and he was standing on the roof and I was so embarrassed that my boyfriend saw the secret, you know, the family secret. Oh. And my brother was spying on us. He put um, his eye down to the keyhole in my door and would look through it to see if he could catch me when I was getting undressed. My father put uh, like a wax-like substance to block it. It was the old fashioned key with mm -hmm. where you took a metal key and twisted it. I gotcha. And he would figure out, my brother would figure out how to push the little wad of wax out of the way so that mm -hmm. he could get a view. But he never touched me. He did threaten me one time because my, I had had my boyfriend over at the house, which was completely against the regulations. <laughs> my parents weren't home. Right. Somehow my brother figured out that my boyfriend was there and he came into my bedroom when I was laying in bed and he told me that he would tell my parents that my boyfriend had been there unless I let him look at me. Oh. And I knew what he was asking. Right. And I said, you know what, you, you just go ahead and tell them because what you're threatening me with is worse than them knowing. Right. And he never said a word oh. about this. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. But I mean, it was, you know, I, I think about what you went through, Rena, and I can empathize to a degree because I never had a feeling of safety in that house. I always had that feeling that my brother could be lurking around the corner, you know, wanting to get glimpses of me. Uh, he later went on to get some treatment, which was unsuccessful. But he's, you know, that was a problem that affected him. He was mentally ill from the time he was six years old, but mm -hmm. it manifested in this as well as in other ways. Well, thank you for sharing your story, Pat. I'm very proud of you. This is the first time. <laughs> right. I've, no, it's, it, it is the first time I've talked about it on this podcast. And I rarely mention it because there's an element of I don't want to create a horrified reaction in other people or people saying, oh, Pat, poor you. I know it could have turned out to be much worse than it was, but it, it, in and of itself, it was still quite disconcerting to have growing up with my brother in that same household when this was going on. Well, Pat, I think we've just proven here by conversing, by me sharing my story, it's given you the courage to share yours. And it's a domino effect that uh, sharing our story, getting it out there, we have nothing to be ashamed of because we aren't the perpetrators of these crimes. Um, so thank you for sharing your story with your listener because with your viewer, 
you're showing how it is a domino effect by me sharing my story. It gave you the courage to share yours. And that's what it's all about. It's we are not alone. We're here to help each other. And so my, my advice is, you know, if, if I had a story to tell, I knew the people that I could share my story with and I knew the people I couldn't. So it, mm -hmm. it, find someone safe to tell. And yes, I am on the RAIN Speaker Bureau, R-A-I-N-N. -N. They're a great place to call for help. And I know you have other resources as well. You've, you've got an online course that you've put together to help people. Yes, it's called the Thrive Perspective. And I help survivors become Sir Thrivers. And I'm so thrilled. I had Sir Thriver trademark last year. Be, mm. and, and I w didn't want just Thriver. I wanted it to be Sir Thriver because I want to show that I'm not ashamed of my past. The Sir is part of what helped me become a thriver. So Sir Thriver and the, and the online program is called The Thrive Perspective. And people can find me at renaromano.com. All right, let's spell that. It's R-E-N-A-R-O-M-A-N-O.com. Correct. Perfect. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for that. Any parting advice or thoughts that you would share on your topic before we complete this podcast? Well, because we're talking about legal nurses too. And, and um, so I want to thank the lawyers. I want to thank the nursing community and the advocates out there for all that you do to help survivors. And like I said, I'll never, ever forget that nurse who helped me. And there's been a lot of lawyers who have helped me along the way as well. They're first responders. I just want to say, be proud. Be proud of your past. Be proud of everything you've gone through. And if we look at it a little differently, and there's always an upside. That's why I call it the Thrive Perspective. And I like to say that um, there's always another way to look at things. Instead of being ashamed of my past, I'm proud that I survived it. And I want other people to be proud of what they've survived because I like, and I also have a saying that um, life is, uh, you know, when I traded my expectation of my life to an appreciation for my life, that's when things started to change for me so that I could live a happy, healthy, productive life. So that's what I want to share. Your phrase, there's always another way to look at it, really resonates because that applies to so many aspects of life. The, yep. the positive and the negative, the opportunities, the half full, half empty glass concept. Yep. The people who make tragedy into something beautiful. I just finished editing a book for one of the people who went through my book authoring mastery course. And she talked about her experiences as a nurse for 50 years. And one of the patients she took care of was a young man who was paralyzed by a bullet in a gang fight. And he said, this is the best thing that could have happened to me. Because if I had continued, I would have ended up being part of that gang and I would have been dead by the time I was 30 years old. There's always another way to look at it. And that's what I say. And I've, when I traded my expectation of my life to an appreciation for my life, and I appreciate, I'm grateful for everything I've gone through because it's made me who I am today. Had my life taken a different road, I may not appreciate what I have now as much as I do. And that's what I want people to look at. Yeah, it sucks what we went through. But how can we turn that around? Because I think somebody, when you find the courage to share your story, your story could save a life. And then on that note, Rena, thank you so much for spending time with me, uh, sharing your insights and your experiences with our listener. I appreciate having you on the show. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. You're most welcome. And for you who's listening to this, thank you for sharing your time 
by listening to this show. I hope that you found it to be inspiring. It's given you something to think about. And you'll be back next week with a new guest, a new topic, a new show. And be sure to tell other legal nurse consultants who you know about Legal Nurse Podcast. You can catch us on our website at podcast.legalnursebusiness.com. You can catch the show on my YouTube channel on Legal Nurse Business, or you can catch the audio program on Spotify, Google Play, uh, Apple Podcasts, and a number of other platforms. Thanks so much. This is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast, and I'm speaking today with Marjorie Salson. Marjorie is going to be sharing some tips with you about communication. Marjorie, tell our listener what you're going to be covering in your show. Basically, uh, I'm going to be discussing how to approach your responsibilities as a witness and also your dealings with the attorney before you actually get on the stand with what I call communication confidence. What are the ways that you can come into the power of your voice, share your expertise, your authority, and handle any nerves that may be attacking you in the process so that you are able to do the job that you uh, want to do at the level of expertise that you have and desire to share. Be sure to look for the podcast with Marjorie Salson coming up on Legal Nurse Podcast. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Pat.